We are continuing our study of the book of John in the last several chapters. Jesus has been in conflict with a group of people called the Pharisees. They were the religious know-alls of the day. And they are trying to discredit Jesus by discrediting his teaching. They're trying to discredit Jesus by discrediting his social standing. And in this passage, they use ammunition of saying, well, our father is Abraham. And today, if you were to meet somebody new, say at work or at church, and the first thing they said is, well, my father's Larry, you would say, so what? We don't care whose people's fathers are, unless it might be Bill Gates or President or Warren Buffett or something like that. You're just a normal person. Uh, we don't really care who your father is or, or where your family came from. We judge people on their own and we build relationships with people individually, not family to family, usually. But if we go back 2,000 years and I would meet you on the street and you were to say, well, my father is Jacob, that would tell me three basic things. Knowing who your father is, I would know where you lived, I would know what kind of work you did, and I would know your financial standing. That is because in the Jewish culture, land was given by tribe, by family, back in the book of Joshua, when they claimed the promised land. And it's built into the law that land never moves out of a family or tribal area. And so when they went to Babylon and came back, and that's talked about in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the land was given back to families. <laughs> And if you were part of the tribe of Dan, if you were tri part of the tribe of uh, Ephraim or Manasseh or any of the other 12 tribes, I would know that you would live in this section of town, that your family owned this block or this acreage over here. And unlike today, when you grew up, you just moved next door. And you did that because whatever job your dad had, you would also do. So if your dad was a making pottery, you were also a maker of pottery. And so if you said that your father was Jacob the pottery maker, then I would know, ah, you, you're a pottery maker too, because family businesses kept on. If your family were a farmer, you would be a farmer. All these sorts of things. And wealth was also transferred within the family name. And so if a grandfather or a great-grandfather of yours was very wealthy, I would know that name because gossip was pretty big back in old Jerusalem, and I would know that at least a portion of that, of that standing was yours, and so I would know a lot about you because you had a certain father in a certain part of the town, and so what they're doing is they're taking this understanding that the lineage means something, that where you came from means something, and they're saying, Abraham is our father. They're saying, we do the same thing that Abraham did. The same relationship with God that Abraham has, I have. Now every Jew, even every Jew today, every Jew back then, uh, is a biological descendant of Abraham. Abraham is the great, 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 Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And the 12 sons become the, became the 12 tribes of Israel. And every Jew that exists today, every Jew that existed back then, is a descendant of one of those 12 sons of Israel. And because they saw themselves accurately as the descendants of a man named Israel, when they were given 
land by the United Nations. They called it Israel. And so everybody who is Jewish today belongs to the major tribe of Israel. And so if you look, for example, on Ancestry.com, and you look way back, you would see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and one of the 12 names of the tribes as the starting point of the Jewish people. But they're not saying to Jesus that they are biological descendants of Abraham. That is a well-known thing. They were actually saying that we are spiritual descendants of Abraham. That this fact that they are holding on to Abraham means that they believe they have the same deal with God that Abraham had. They have the same relationship. Now, if you go back into Genesis when the story of Abraham is there, ultimately Abraham is called a friend of God. There was no organized religion with Abraham. It was God having conversations with him. The Jewish faith wasn't codified into an organized religion until you get Moses on Mount Sinai back with Abraham. God said, I'm going to give you this, you do this, and Abraham did this, and Abraham kind of got off the path, and God pulled him back. And it was a relationship that was, in many ways, casual between God and Abraham. He didn't have any requirements on him except to move from place to place to place to place when God told him that he was to move. And so... The Pharisees are saying that we have the same relationship with God, that we are special, that we are followers of Abraham, who is a follower of God, and you, Jesus, are not, which is a strange thing to say, because he was Jewish like they were Jewish, he is a biological descendant of Abraham. And we know now, because we have the rest of the story in the New Testament, that Jesus Christ was more tight with God than Abraham ever was. And so what they're saying is that just like Abraham, they hear God and they believe him and they do what God wants him them to do. And so the criticism that Jesus is giving them about being selfish and self-centered and following their own desires more than the desires of God. The Pharisees have taken the, the relationship that was built into Judaism and turned it into a series of rules, and they worship the rules, they worship the law more than they worship God. So Jesus said, well, if you're like Abraham, you would have loved me, but instead you want to kill me. And so there's a disconnect between saying I follow God and doing stuff that God never wants me to do. And when we look at this, it is a lot more than a, a historical study of various religious groups that existed 2,000 years ago. I think that one reason God puts these stories in the Bible is he wants us to look at them and say, am I a Pharisee? Have I turned my relationship with God into a do this and don't do that? Have I turned my relationship with God, with God into, a, into a works of salvation? Or is it casual and friendly like it was with Abraham? So are we more of a Pharisee or are we more of Jesus? And the plan of being a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, over time, will change our attitudes, change our desires, and make us more like Jesus. And so they say, well, uh, we don't want to kill you. And in previous passages, they said you have a demon. And Jesus said that if you're truly a follower of Abraham, truly if you're a follower of God, you would love Jesus. Because God the Father loves God the Son. And so when they're saying Abraham is their father, when they say God is their father, Jesus is looking at their words and saying, okay, you're saying this. And then he's looking at their actions and saying, but you don't do this. 
And so their actions are not supported by their words, and their words are different than their actions. And that's another thing that we need to look at today, is do the words that we say match the actions that we do? Jesus knows their beliefs by looking at their actions. We might say today that he reverse engineers the Pharisees to find out what's really in their heart, what's really in their soul. He looks at what they do, and he looks at what they say, and then says, well, what you're doing means that your father is the devil, and all the disciples are probably going, oh yeah, yeah, that's it right there. Because he has just called them not worshippers of God, but worshippers of Satan. But their actions are so far off track. They have nothing to do with God, but they have everything to do with Satan. And so what does Satan do? Jesus gives a little explanation about the activities of Satan. Uh, they cannot bear, uh, people who follow Satan cannot bear to hear the teachings of Jesus. And I have talked to people who, in their earlier life, used to be avid churchgoers, and now they don't go to church anymore. Now they have no Christian relationships with anybody. And I ask, you know, what's going on? Why is it this way? And they basically say, well, I don't get anything out of it. I'm not being fed. They might as well say, I can't bear to hear the teachings of Jesus, because church makes them so uncomfortable. Because we talk about living a righteous life, we talk about having a relationship with Jesus that can be uncomfortable for a lot of people, can be uncomfortable for the people who, for example, have Satan as their father. Uh, there is no murderer. It uh, says there's a murderer from the beginning. The uh, first murder in the Bible was uh, Cain killing Abel, two sons of Adam and Eve, Cain killed Abel. And God makes it clear when he's speaking to Abel that Satan is at the door, that this is a satanic motivation to do this. And God gives Cain a chance to repent before he kills his brother, and he says, No, I'm going to follow Satan. And so at the very beginning, one of Satan's first activities after receiving Adam and Eve is to cause a murder. And so it's going to be murder from the beginning. Uh, all murders today are satanically inspired. Uh, it is very difficult to see a, a cold-blooded murder as a godly activity. Uh, that is what Satan does to destroy families, to destroy society. So we can also see how Satan murders the truth, how Satan will murder reputations. Uh, Satan is a destroyer, and God is a savior. That is because there's no truth in Satan's activities. Uh, the various religions out there have no truth. Uh, we are the holders of truth uh, as Christians. Uh, there are many, many denominations and flavors of Christianity that at the core were all about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ being the only way. Jesus Christ the only way. That's the truth you will not find. And anything motivated by Satan that is because it's lies, lies, more lies. The father of lies, every lie that's out there, is a satanic lie. And so he's applying these things to the Pharisees, that they, they basically stick their fingers in their ears and start humming when Jesus is talking, they can't bear it here. Uh, there, there's evidence that in many ways the Pharisees were religious, organized crime, and if you stood against them, uh, like they're trying to do with Jesus, they rub you out. And so Jesus is standing against this satanic thing that has a halo on it. They are saying, we are followers of God, but at their core, it is from Satan. So what do we do? We look at this and say, well, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, how do we do it? And the, the first question is, was this a conscious decision by the Pharisees? And I think if you look at the history of the origin of the Pharisees in the intertestamental period, that the, the Jews were in Babylon 
and they came back. And the leaders were saying, we have to make sure that we don't fall into the same sin pattern as a nation so that God will take us away again. And so they, they set up these Bible scholars, these Old Testament scholars, and said, we need to look at what we're doing as a nation. We need to make sure that we're doing Passover correctly, and the Feast of Tabernacles, and Pura, and all these various things correctly. And if we're not, put us back on the right track. Well, over centuries, it became something where the, the Pharisees would then go and the people would say, well, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting over here, but if you give me, you know, a couple of denarii, I'll uh, forgive it and I'll overlook it. And they found that there was a way to make money off of forgiveness and to make money off of righteous living. And so they became, generation after generation, very wealthy. And so by the time we get Jesus, it was a class of people. It wasn't just Bible scholars. It was actually an organized group that was hired by the priests and hired by various organizations to teach righteousness for a fee. And Jesus is coming and saying, first of all, it's all free. You can find out what God wants you to do for free. And following him is free. And salvation is free. And when greedy people hear the word free, they can't bear to hear it. And that's the first problem, is that he was messing up their financial standing, but he was also messing up their power, because the teaching of Jesus is that everybody has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't have to go through a priest, I don't have to go through a Pharisee, I can go directly to him with my Bible and the power of the Holy Spirit and have a relationship just like Abraham did. We are spiritual children of Abraham. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he gave us the same relationship that Abraham had with him. Casual, friendly, and based on love. We hear, we obey, and we're blessed. So what do we do to make sure we don't become embarrassed? First, read the Bible. I read the Bible a lot. Read the Bible every day. It is the Word of God to you. Uh, the Word of God is not generally on TV. There was a Bible mini series. But you need to read your Bible. You need to listen to your Bible. Uh, people have read it on the CD. Uh, you can get it and listen to it while you drive. The Bible needs to be brought into you because that is what the basis of your relationship with Jesus Christ is. And it's also a test. If you can, if you're repulsed by the Bible, well, that's a sign that that sin has a heavy influence upon you because he can't stand for you to read the Bible. People of God, on the other hand, cannot get enough of it. Uh, we need to be hungry for the Word of God. We need to be in the Word of God. Second is watch what you say. Uh, do your best to speak the truth about yourself. Uh, it will destroy a witness and it will destroy your reputation if you build yourself up as this great person of God when there is no action to back it up. Uh, Paul talks about having a sober evaluation about yourself. It doesn't mean that if you're struggling with a sin, you put it on a t-shirt and walk around telling everybody, but you don't build yourself up more than you are. And that is the that is the paradox of Christianity, because we are called to be perfect, we are called to do all these great things, and we desire for them to happen. But when we fall short, we can't let our pride deny that we've fallen short. Uh, we do that by looking at yourself. Are you looking at yourself in the mirror? You wake up in the morning, and you look, and you go, ah, look at that. And you say, well, what am I? What did I do today? Some people will end their day by looking at their activities, perhaps journaling your activities and saying, God was really with me today. God really showed me great things today. Or today was a struggle and I didn't really hear the voice of God today. If these things are true for all Christians all the time, 
We have updates and down days. We have victory days. We have days where things don't go that great. And we just need to evaluate ourselves correctly. Uh, Paul calls that self-examination. Uh, the easiest thing to do is compare yourself to other people. And you say, well, I'm not that bad. Uh, I'm not in ISIS. There's a big one. You can say that. Yeah, and they're okay then. But God doesn't say compare yourself to the most evil in the world. God says compare yourself to Him. And when we compare ourselves to Him, then we get a true and honest evaluation of what we're really doing. And we don't do this to beat ourselves up. We do this to move forward and to self-improve. And lastly, it's one of the toughest things, is to be accountable. Find somebody that you can pray with, find somebody that you can talk about your struggles with, find somebody that you can be accountable with, so that together you can move forward and become more Christ-like. Uh, there are many people out there today who call themselves Christians, but in fact they're Pharisees. And we need to make sure that if we say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, that I am a true believer, that I truly follow Jesus Christ, and that I'm in my Bible, and I'm looking at myself, and I'm understanding what my true relationship is, that I have a position that is unequal to my condition, Needs a little work. That's fine. As long as you're working on it with the power of the Holy Spirit, then you won't fall into the trap of being a Pharisee. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just praise you for these teachings about Jesus in conflict so that we can see which side we're truly on. So that we can see that if we, uh, if we really seek truth or if we live in a, a life of lies. Lord, we just praise you that through the power of the Holy Spirit we can look at ourselves correctly, we can look at ourselves accurately, and we can move forward day by day, week by week, year by year, and we can get closer to you, and we can become more God. Lord, we praise you for that, and that's your blessing on this day. We ask you for the Lord Jesus Christ.